from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome all to the Library of Congress. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African and Middle East Division here at the library. We're just upstairs. And uh, I'm delighted to see everyone here on this very rainy day. Um, we are um, a, a division, one of the many divisions here at the library, um, which is responsible for 78 different countries uh, including all the countries of Africa, the countries of the Middle East, Central Asia, the Caucasus. We're made up of three divisions, the African, the Near East, and the Hebraic section. And we collect materials from the region in the languages of the region. And we're a, a division, medium-sized division of 20 people, specialists, people who know the region, people who know the languages and the culture of the people of the 78 countries. And um, we are a, we follow in a way the mission of the library, which is we collect materials, uh, we process them, we shelve them, we preserve them, and then we serve them to our researchers. But in addition to this, we do a number of other things. Um, we have uh, displays of our collections so that people can see actually the items themselves. We invite the authors, the writers of these books. And today is a case in point with Ambassador Swanee Hunt. And the um, writers themselves are very much part of what we consider our library family, because they are the ones who create these books. They are the ones who have experienced the various uh, upheavals in the regions that we cover, and certainly the African Middle East Division, uh, the countries for which they are responsible, um, have gone through a great deal of trauma. And uh, we can say that one of the ones that have suffered most, perhaps in recent memory, is certainly Rwanda. And yet there is not enough that has been written about Rwanda. There is not enough knowledge uh, in um, not only, it's a, not only in, in the world about Rwanda, but even among the scholarly community, even among those who have studied it most. So uh, when we invite speakers, you know, we invite them to leave after their discussion more enlightened, more enriched by their own um, experience, by their own understanding of the cultures and the people they have encountered while during their do, doing their work. We also uh, increase our own collections by acquiring their books and their research and sharing it with patrons when they come. As I was mentioning, our division has specialists. And uh, each one of our specialists uh, focuses on a number of countries. And among those uh, in the African section is um, Eve Ferguson. And Eve handles uh, East Africa in particular. Uh, she handles outreach, acquisition, reference services, um, for the public, and also, as all of us are, um, we serve Congress, our uh, first patron. Uh, she also uh, works on, on her own time, in the weekends and at night, as a freelance arts writer, and uh, she has taught literature and writing at the University of the District of Columbia. It is Eve who has uh, actually organized, helped organize this uh, program with uh, Ambassador Hunt. But we are doubly privileged today 
by having also the uh, ambassador of Rwanda, um, a, an exceptional uh, um, uh, woman, uh, Ambassador Muka, Mukantabana, uh, is also a friend of the speaker. And so we are thrice blessed, if I may say so, um, by having uh, together the ambassador of Rwanda speaking with Ambassador Swani Hand about a subject uh, that we are all learning more about and need to know more about today. And to introduce, to introduce Ambassador Hunt is our own Eve Ferguson. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very glad to see people here this very cold, rainy afternoon for a very special program, something I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, I am Eve Ferguson, Reference Librarian for East Africa. Uh, this is the third program I've done on Rwanda. The previous two were on subjects that most of us are familiar about with Rwanda, and that is the 1994 Rwandan genocide. We did a film, As We Forgive, and we did a book, uh, Killing Neighbors, by Leanne Fuji. Film was by Laura Waters Hinson. And I am really pleased today, and it's always been my goal, to do a program on something really good about Rwanda. So today, we are going to hear from Ambassador Swanee Hunt in conversation with Ambassador Mathilde Mukantabana about what is good going on in Rwanda. We know that there are a lot of things that are going well in Rwanda. Rwanda's economy is wonderful. Um, the arts and culture of Rwanda have always been notable. And uh, just for my own interest, uh, I have to mention Hillywood, the <laughs> Rwandan film industry, which is now taking off and making its mark on the African continent and beyond. So there are wonderful things happening in Rwanda, and today we're going to celebrate those good things happening in Rwanda, and they are happening at the hands of women. And we know in so many instances, women are the peacemakers in the world. We are the ones who bring forth the next generations, and we are the ones who ensure that those generations have a fruitful and productive life. So with no further ado, let me introduce our author today, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, the author of Rwandan Women Rising, among other books. Um, you will see some of her books in the display in the back, including her autobiography. But let me uh, give you a brief bio of Ambassador Swanee Hunt. Swanee Hunt founded and chairs Inclusive Security, a Washington-based nonprofit whose bold goal is to transform decision-making about war and peace. Through government constitution, research, leadership development, and advocacy, inclusive security increases the participation of all stakeholders, particularly women, in preventing, resolving, and rebuilding after deadly conflicts. Her work in this area began when, as the U.S. Ambassador to Austria, from 1993 to 1997, she hosted negotiations and international symposia focused on stabilizing the neighboring Balkan states. Her fourth book, Rwandan Women Rising, which came out in May of this year, explores how including women leaders enabled Rwanda to rebuild after the 1994 genocide, setting a powerful example for women Sorry, <laughs> powerful example for countries across the world. Inclusive Security is one program of Swanee Hunt Alternatives, a private foundation she created in 1981, which also combats the demand for illegal purchase sex, supports leaders of US social movements, and advocates for, pol for political parity of women in elected office. At Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, Dr. Hunt is the Eleanor Roosevelt Lecturer in Public Policy, founder of the Women in Public Policy Program, 
core faculty at the Center for Public Leadership and senior advisor at the Carr Center for Human Rights. She holds two master's degrees, a doctorate in theology, and seven honorary degrees. A Dallas native, she is widely published, a widely published commentator, photographer, and composer. She was married for 25 years to Charles Ansbacher, international conductor and empresario. Her world includes their three children and a menagerie of cat, parrot, horses, bison, and grandchildren. And I do want to add, though, that she is also a renowned celebrity in Denver, Colorado, um, where she lived for some time and uh, where my part of my family lives. So she is also considered a Coloradan. <laughs> so I would like to welcome Ambassador Swanee Hunt to say a few words about our interviewer today, Ambassador Matilde Munkantabana, who changed her schedule in order to be here with us today for this special program. Thank you. inviting us to be here at the beautiful, beautiful Library of Congress. How did we first meet? I don't exactly remember. It seems like we've always been connected at the heart. <laughs> Several years ago, when you invited the women to Harvard. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And be sure you speak into yeah, this, please. right? Yeah. You have to turn it on. Yes. Do you see the switch? Yes. I think that's it. Yuck. Um, I met Ambassador Kantabana and immediately knew that I had come to know one of the treasures of Rwanda. Uh, she will tell you more about her experience, but, but let me say that she has a deep, deep understanding of her country and of the forces inside of her country that have led to really this book. And even though we didn't know each other at that time. Uh, and when she was named to represent her country to this, uh, to our country, you know, that's a very, very big deal. And I was impressed with the wisdom of President Kagame back home in choosing you because you have such a deep understanding of the United States being tenured faculty in history in California. And, and so I think being, having the larger context in mind as you're able to describe your country to our country has been outstanding. And may I begin by reading a short passage and then turn this over to you for however you want to conduct this interview. No, thank you so much, Swani. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Thank you. This is in the preface. And I wanted to read it because it gives you a sense of, of the whole. Hundreds of conversations I've had over the past 16 years reveal an untold tale. Laden with personal burdens, but driven by an ethic of responsibility, women stepped forward. In villages, mothers made sure bodies were buried. One initiated a countrywide adoption program that found homes for nearly 100,000 children whose parents were murdered. The stories of Rwandan women are awe-inspiring in their passion and startling in their pragmatism. The people around me were women, says Father Emmanuel, a newly ordained priest who had lost his family in the genocide. His first posting after seminary was to a rural parish. Their church had been burned and bulldozed with hundreds of desperate people inside. Women helped me reconstruct the parish physically and in terms of the community. 
The way I saw it, men were more affected by the violence, even though I think women suffered more. Afterward, men couldn't do much. The women saw that they had no alternative. And then my words, as chaos cracked open the culture, women were no longer confined to holding positions of influence solely in their homes. Given the urgent needs pressing all around them, they expanded their leadership at a revolutionary pace. Still, this wasn't a feminist uprising by design. I think that's a really interesting point for those of us who have been part of feminist uprisings by design, okay? <laughs> We didn't immediately think of creating an organization. Chantal was a founding member of a widow's organization I visited in 2001, now one of the most influential civil society groups in the country. She goes on, most women in our group were housewives who hadn't had much schooling. We met because we needed to meet, to listen and understand each other. We needed to think things through together like how we would provide for our children. And in my words, with a strong pull from the new president, Paul Kagame, women pushed for female-friendly policies and prominent positions in the government, led initiatives to cope with the traumatic aftermath of genocide, and established businesses in the extremely fragile economy. Many who had found their voices at the national level returned to their rural communities to encourage more women to vie for public office. So these were women who actually at that point were in the parliament and instead of simply enjoying their power, they actually went back to their rural districts and, and worked very, very hard to get other women to run not just for parliament, but for any positions. In 2003, the first election since the genocide, women won 48.8% of the seats in the lower house of parliament, far surpassing the newly mandated 30% quota. In 2008, it took even larger strides, securing 56% of seats and became the first parliament in history, anywhere in the world, with a female majority. Their gains weren't only political, across society, women took up influential roles. Does anyone here know what the percentage is now? After 50, 65. 65, right. On a good day, 64, 65, right, yes. Thank you for knowing that. And, um, isn't that astounding? It, it's something that we, you know, across the, the way here from the US Congress, we have no sense of that, no sense at all. And so as we talk about they did this and that in spite of the genocide, et cetera, et cetera, there was this pull from, this to, from the top and this push up from the bottom, I don't think we can have a clue of what that really means if we don't turn to Ambassador Mukundavana. In 30, it would be the equivalent of 32 million Americans being killed by their neighbors this fall. 32 million Americans this fall being killed by their neighbors. But we don't have any way to, to conceptualize that. And yet, and yet, you all, you not only lived through it, but you, you surged into the opening. But surging into the opening sounds too positive. I, I, could you go back and give us a sense of where you were, what you heard, what you saw, what, anything you want about the genocide, and then, and then, even though we've read a lot about the genocide, we've seen movies, and we can go on and talk about this, but not without you really rooting us in the background. Thank you so much, Suani. Uh, 
You, you read a very powerful passage, and I think it gives a good uh, beginning. Uh, and quite frankly, I agree with you, you can't truly appreciate what women have done if you don't go back and look at you know, genocide, and what happened in, in Rwanda. Uh, you just mentioned it, but you can imagine for a country that is the size of Maryland, very small, when a million people die within three months, uh, n not killed by any, any calamity from outside, by, by their own neighbors, uh, three million people who were implicated in the genocide, uh, and you find that you have death, but also people leaving the country, you know, going to neighboring countries like Congo, uh, Tanzania, and, and Uganda. So in 1994-1995, it was practically empty. You know, few survivors, people coming back, and the, the site was one of blood. You, you know, completely destroyed the housing, the few infrastructures in existence, but also the bodies in the streets. You know, I have to tell you, in this whole stuff, I lost 70 people of my own family, including my own parents and younger siblings. And until 2009, 2009, it was almost like yesterday, we we're still going back to bury the dead. We we're still finding him you know, hidden somewhere because of a system of justice that was telling people to tell us where the bodies were. So the country was but all destroyed. We, and when we talk about destruction, it's not just about death. It's about all the institutions, all the, you know, when you can't count on your own church, because the majority of the people died in churches, as you know, uh, when even you can't count on your own family, all the institutions were completely affected by genocide. You couldn't trust the state. You couldn't trust the church. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as we talk about the whole area of recon uh, reconstruction and reconciliation, just a few months ago, the president of Rwanda met with the Pope. And now we are trying to put behind our understanding about the church and the brotherhood of men and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is that our country lost the soul of the people. We didn't really have much to draw from, any experience, any roadmap to rebuild the country. And when we come back to the women, uh, for historical reasons also, most women, number one, they didn't kill also the survivors. The gender ratio was, uh, was skewed because of genocide. The men left, the others were killed, and we were left with a higher percentage of women. But even starting with that, they were the ones who were left to mend the fabric of a broken society. They were married to the killers. They were widows. They were, if anybody, anyone who was victimized by genocide, it was the women. They were raped. We had a number of, you know, as a matter of fact, if you go back, and I know that Eva, Eva would be interested in knowing that there's a movie on Rwanda, but on international tribunal called The Uncondemned, that has been shown. The women came to testify in Tanzania, and now the, the crime of rape is included within the genocide. So we find a nation that was completely, we say maybe there was a light still left shining, that's why we're still alive. Right. And I think you, you can't really find it anywhere else, but among the women who were able to take chaff and grain and bad and ugly and were able to mold, you know, to put together families, create new families, and also really started the whole arduous journey of uh, rebuilding the nation. And as you said very well, I, I, I will be remiss if I don't also add that we had a very strong vision. We had leadership that was intending to empower the women as part of the whole community in the empowerment of all the people of Rwanda to take, uh, to, be, to become agents of their own destiny, to become agents in reconstruction. And women were central in that particular area. So uh, before I finish, I want to say that as we rebuild the nation, and I think Eve mentioned the fact that Rwanda now is doing pretty well. I'm not going to brag, but we are doing very well for a country coming out of genocide, and we've done even better than what we were thinking. But retracing these steps of women, writing about women and their empowerment, 
is also part of that reconstruction we are talking about. So I need really to uh, give kudos to Suwani because she took all this time to write about women, to go and interview women, to see how they have been there. This narrative of ascent, you were able to retrace in your book, and uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Well, I didn't mean it to be a longitudinal study, but it turned out to be one. Yes. Because I went in 2000 for the first time. But I don't want to gloss over something that you said. And you and I haven't talked about this, but when you said they went to Tanzania to testify in the court, and now rape is you know, a crime of war. Actually, the women who went from the village of Taba, these are women who had been gang raped, who had been raped till they were unconscious, who had been raped in the town square, you know, 14 years old and then impregnated. It's, I mean, these are horrible, horrible stories. And then there's a woman social worker who starts working with them in a group and helps them starting to tell their stories mm -hmm. and, and support each other. Then you've got the world court happening, uh, not the world court, but the tribunal, the UN tribunal happening over in Arusha. And so the question becomes, will any of them go and testify? Now these are women who are illiterate they have never been mm. outside of their country. Mm. And they, with all they've been through, they go over, they walk into uh, a room that is much, much more sterile than any that they've ever seen. There are all these people in these robes and, and they have, they're speaking a different language. And I mean, everything about it is set up to be disempowering, everything about it. Right. And yet, they testify about what happened to them, which is a taboo. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, so when we say, oh, and then they went to Tanzania and testified, I mean, it, it, that's a, such an example mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And you take an example like yours, 70 family members killed. That was all over the country, that isn't, simply about Matilda Mukandavana. Yeah, that was exactly. all over the country. Mm -hmm. The trauma and the, what we would call PTSD. I mean, the whole country was suffering from post-traumatic stress. That's right, so, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, no, that's, that's <laughs> enough for me to say. No, no, you said it very well. I, the whole country was suffering. There was no family in Rwanda or no individual who was untouched. You know, you can even imagine, for instance, generations, uh, when we talk about generations and the incredible task we still have to continue, because when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about uh, building a nation, it's an ongoing situation, because you have children, even, okay, two cases of children I can give you. They are products of rape. You know, here you have a woman who was victimized by somebody who killed their husband, and you produce a child. So these kids are coming of age right now. You can imagine the sense of alienation they feel, especially that sometimes initially they were a constant reminder of the wounds. You know, how, and when we talk about our own reconciliation in the country, it's not something that is thrown at people. Sometimes it's on intimate level. It's a look in the eyes of that child, and to say, I'm going to love you because you are my child, you are a Rwandan, you are a victim of circumstances. But that you have to understand on a human equation. This is going beyond the human equation. Because in the eyes, he might be looking like someone who victimized you, who killed your husband, killed your yes, children, right. and so on and so forth. But also, for the children who were born from parents who were killers, this is the huge generation we have. And that's what we have been trying to mend. You know, you are not responsible for the sins of the father. And women were a big part of that because you raised the children, you raised the new generation of Rwandans. You know, so that level of reconciliation comes from the, the lowest level when you, you are able to really come together as people and to say, we are going to create a new phenomenon. 
you are going to come, those things are going to be cleansed. It's what you are going to do for your country and for yourself. And so the, the women have that double task. Even when we talk about women in politics, if we talk about women in the parliament, <coughs> The, you really have to take all these things together. It's not just about one job or another. It's, it's mending the whole fabric. It's uh, when you go to those villages and, you know, our parliamentarians are not the ones sitting in, hot, in uh, um, offices. No, they travel. Each one of them is assigned a village or an area they have to visit to see that the things are being done, but also the level of uh, how the families are coming along. And when I say families and extended family, quite a few uh, lost their own children, and now they are raising the orphans. Yeah, but uh, you know, uh, the yeah. amazing thing that mm -hmm. I've seen is there'll be a woman, and I will use the, the words Hutu and Tutsi, you know, um, and 90% of the country was Hutu and a uh, huge, huge number of the perpetrators, huge percentage were, were mm -hmm. Hutu. And, and so I, I say that because I'll be with a Hutu woman mm -hmm. and she's talking to me about having gone into the jungle and brought her husband out because he had fled yes, and he was the head of intelligence for the, the Hutu who were in Congo and who were doing raids at night, you know, to, keeping the war going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as I'm in her home, and I'm meeting her children, mm -hmm. and there are three children, and, and then there's some other children, and they're hiding behind doors, and everyone's playing and laughing, et cetera. And I say, now, who, are these all your children? She said, yes. And so, and I said, but this, you know, and I'm trying to put it together. Mm -hmm. So two of them are biologically hers with her husband, and then there are three others, and they are all adopted. But these are Tutsi children mm -hmm. who had been orphaned. So she, in the middle of this Hutu story, takes it for granted that she's raising three Tutsi children. <laughs> and that is something yeah, is I saw something. over and over and over in both directions. Mm -hmm. I saw Tutsi mm -hmm. women raising Hutu children, etc. Mm. You know, we don't have a, we, don't, we just can't get our our minds wrapped around that. I mean, that would be like mm -hmm. immediately after the liberation of Dachau, if you were to say, okay, well, you German family, uh, we're going to give you three Jewish kids to raise, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. well, we, we would never think of doing that. Mm -hmm. And yet that was actually a, a practice that was very much sure. promoted. Mm -hmm. It was natural, but it was promoted. And you, you take those kinds of practices and multiply them by the dozens and the dozens, and you come to understand mm -hmm. how women were able to knit the country together. And it mm -hmm. wasn't just women, but women played really mm -hmm. the leading role, whether it was creating a justice system, mm -hmm. because without justice, it's very hard to have peace. So they created this local justice system, but they also created a healthcare system and a system to stop marital rape or mm -hmm. other kinds of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And then they created this whole reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in each village, there were ways of getting the villagers to tell their stories to each other. And I mean, there's one, there's one example mm -hmm. where, there were these camps that were sort of reintegration camps for the mostly men who were in Congo. So how are they going to come back home, right? But you've got to get them to come back home so that they won't be the enemies from outside. So you get these, these men to come into this camp for, that the women have put together. But then the women are thinking after a month or two, where are these guys going to go? Like, the only place for them to go is back home to their villages. It's not like people have, you know, a second estate or something to go to. So they've got to go home. So the women then start going to these camps to sit in circles with these men who have got to be reintroduced to say, you know, what's it going to be like for you when you go back? 
and you have killed the, the children of the people in the house next to yours. Like, how are you gonna deal with that? And, and that kind of very practical action that comes from this hugely generous spirit. I, I will complete that thought before we ask for questions, but I wanna complete that thought with a, I was told of a woman who went in, into that camp to help with this reintegration, you know, helping people think through what it was going to be like. Okay, and she sees the young man who slaughtered her son, and they were they were mm -hmm. kids together, mm -hmm. and she sees him, and he sees her, and there's this terrible moment, and then she says, "I want you to come home with me." And she says to him, you don't have a family to go home to, and I don't have a son. So I want you to be my son now. And she says, when, when, um, when you get married, I'm going to give you the cow. And that, for those of you who know of this culture, that is about as precious as a gift can be. And then she says, and when I die, this home is yours. Mm -hmm. That's the story of Rwanda over and over as women led this reconciliation. Yeah, and you know, you, you said it beautifully. I just want to add that um, all this was made possible because of political will, mm -hmm. because no matter how much Women can try to do it. We've worked with many women in many different countries. Sometimes when there's that lack of political will and also the understanding, actually empowering those women to do so, it can't happen. That's one of the, the foundation to understand that even like uh, the resettlement, the reconciliation, it was a whole uh, country program. And the women came and performed beautifully within that general country program. So it was not an appendage. It's a, what is uh, maybe a takeaway from me and you know, is uh, that there was a very good understanding that once the vision on how to rebuild the country happened, the women became actually the biggest part of that reconstruction, mm -hmm. intricate part of reconstruction. But that thing was embraced by all Rwandans. Rwandans were given the agency to do that, and women in their area and, and even beyond, they were able to perform even more than what we have uh, dreamed of. But uh, again, it's that kind of cohesion between the women, understanding where the country wanted to go, and then they were actually they led the way in many different areas. There's no question that, yeah. as I said earlier, it was mm. the pull from the top, yeah. from the top leadership yeah. that would include President Kagame as the head of the party, mm. and then this push up. Oh, the push women up, yeah. had worked at a civil society level Absolutely. in these women-only village councils. It's a brilliant, brilliant story. And brilliant. How they pushed up, and oh, look at the picture. This is the woman who's the head of the whole village council system council system takes nice her out of office, right? Um, should we see what questions people have? Or yeah, th that would be good, but I, I just, uh, maybe I, I start Please. with the question. Sure. <laughs> is, uh, and many people might have the same question, but is to see, this is a book, it's almost like, a, you know, a labor of love. You've written this book for a long time, and you, you took your time, you did your investigation, you went to Rwanda, you did many things. Tell us why. Why, why did you select Rwanda? There were many areas you know, of, of conflict and many places where women also tried to do similar things. But, it, it, you know, and I've heard from you, but I want you at least to explain it to people. Why Rwanda and why? You really invested uh, all your emotional, spiritual, physical, you know, life to, to write this book. Right. It was very personal for me. Mm. It was, 
you know, in our country. Like, as I said, you know, I'd been part of the women's movement, and we thought we were up against, you know, all of this patriarchy, and it's terrible. You know, we were making 49 cents on the dollar, et cetera, et cetera, when I was in my early <clears throat> 20s. I didn't have any understanding of what women were facing in other places. And so as I began bit by bit understanding more about the world, it became clear to me that that's where I needed to be putting my effort mm. because it would be very, uh, it would be so meaningful to me. And having been brought to Rwanda in 2000 to speak at uh, a meeting of several women, maybe 20 women from the region, and I was the only white face there. Mm. Uh, and I, I came to, to see that if, that there wasn't any place in the world where women were facing as much of a challenge mm -hmm. as they were that moment in time in that particular country. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, as I was hearing stories, and, and, and I actually also, that's when I met President Kagame, too. Mm -hmm. And I, I said to him, you know, if you want to change the face of Rwanda, put women, advance them into leadership positions, and he did that immediately. And they became you know, ambassadors, and they became members of his cabinet in large numbers. So I'm sitting here watching all of this happen, and going back because I was so inspired, and I had been involved with the Bosnian genocide, and, and, and what they were doing in Rwanda, what you all were doing, was so far advanced of anything that was being done in Bosnia. Mm. And I eventually realized that I talked to one woman, mm -hmm. and she would tell me about working in the, creating this justice system. And another woman would tell me about being on the Constitutional Commission that got the 30% quota. And another one would tell me about mm -hmm. you know working um, in somehow with the, um, let's say the education system. Mm -hmm. But none of them had the whole picture of how it all fit together. Mm -hmm. And after I'd been going for about five years, I realized that's the gift I could give because I have the distance. Mm -hmm. And I could analyze how all of this came together. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can open. We have enough time to take several questions from the audience. I want to uh, just put out the housekeeping that uh, when you ask a question, you are agreeing to be in our webcast. This webcast will be available later for people to view on our webpage, uh, African Middle Eastern Division Reading Room webpage, as well as the Library of Congress general webcast at loc.gov. So please speak your question loudly. We will um, then, uh, I think that we will ask the ambassadors to give up one mic and then share the mic as they answer. So uh, do we have some questions? Yes. Young lady. Uh, do we? Okay. Um, 
relates to this. So I can give you a little bit of stats, which is that uh, illiteracy um, was about 51% for women before the genocide. And now, it's compulsory education through ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Now that is extraordinary. And, and that very much affects then the whole emerging business. Um, and because the women, when they got into parliament, one of the first things that, one of the first bills that they passed was uh, the right to inherit land and then land reform. And you know, that right to inherit land, you know, I, I never really had a sense of what that meant, <laughs> how important that was. That's, that's like fundamental when you are living in a home and your husband dies and the whole home goes to his brother mm -hmm. or whatever, and then, then you become impoverished and I mean, that's really basic. And you don't have that home as collateral when you want to start a business. So it's very much all connected. But the point I want to hone in on when I look at other countries, there's so much ado about the idea that unless you have a certain higher level of literacy, you cannot have women fully represented as leaders. That's just not true. I mean, do the arithmetic. It's not even math. Do the mm -hmm. arithmetic. How many women do you need to have right. as significant leaders? A mm -hmm. hundred? Five hundred? Four thousand? Whatever, right? Are you telling me that, that there aren't four thousand women in any country on earth who haven't had you know, college degrees, uh, masters, doctorates, who haven't been extraordinarily well experienced, who haven't traveled the world? Of course there are. And so we have a, a, this false um, relationship that we walk around thinking, oh, well, this is a really, you know, this backward country where women haven't had all of these opportunities, therefore they can't be in leadership. Those, those two don't go together. Do you want to add to that? Or? One tiny thing I can add, but you, <laughs> Swali said it very well, but for uh, just what I'm going to add, especially for Rwanda and women, uh, and you mentioned the land, and that's very, very important for, for Rwanda and women. But I think in terms of after genocide, people didn't have anything. And among the things that were done to empower the people, to, to make people wake up, that economic leverage, basic, was part of the program. It means that whatever Rwanda has created or, or the women themselves have done, what we call homegrown initiatives, they were socioeconomic programs specifically targeting people with nothing. Like, for instance, what they call Giringha, have a cow, where they distribute the cows so the poorest families. Can you have at least a basic, basic beginning? All the elements of reconciliation among women started with economic initiatives, like what they call peace baskets. When they get together, they do stuff together. They bring a certain uh, economic livelihood, but at the same time, they are coming together as people. So those are the things that when you address, you attend to the health issues, you know, people were dying. And, and the, the promotion of universal health coverage was for that. People were dying. Even if the, you survive, sometimes they were dying from AIDS, HIV, they were dying from tuberculosis, they were dying from many diseases. So tackling the issues of health, tackling the issues of poverty were also a big part of our reconstruction efforts that the women promoted. Thank you. Have another question? Yeah. No, you're an ambassador. <laughs>
And I just wanted to say basically two things, and I'll try to figure out how to put this in the form of a question. First, this is a great read. I binge read this on one day from morning to night. These are women who are telling fantastic stories. We're tracing the history of more than two to three decades of their country. You put their comments into context, you explain beautifully the messages, and to be able to take 16 years of interviews mm -hmm. and literally tens of thousands of pages of documentation and to put them into a book that is as readable and mm -hmm. remarkable as this, you really do deserve to be congratulated. The second thing I wanted to say is the book is what I would call women's planning. We all know what man's planning is. It's when men say to you, oh, but Kagame isn't allowing you to look free, or it's only been 20, it's already been 23 years since the genocide of Taman, or, you know, where is the focus on human rights, or why don't you tell us who's a Hutu and who's a Tutu? And what you do in this book is to say, we're looking at this the wrong way. We're looking at a country that has lost everything. Mm -hmm. to be in many ways its own soul. Mm -hmm. And this was not a question of putting human rights on the agenda immediately. It wasn't a question of, you know, how many decades has it been on the my people that took us 87 years from the Constitution to our civil war and more than 240 years and we're still dealing with these issues in the United States in a very fundamental way. So your ability to take it and say to the man who are trying to save you, you don't understand the context, you're reversing that. And in 300 pages, you say, you don't understand the context. This is what we want to do when you have to I guess I'm going to give up on trying to ask this question. <laughs> You could say what, <laughs> what do you think about what I just said. <laughs> uh, there is a what I think about it, okay? And that is that um, after shock and awe, you know, after we bombed the hell out of uh, Baghdad. So I went to the Pentagon, and Don Steinberg knows this because years earlier I had gone to the State Department to meet with him to say, hi, my name is, you know, et cetera. <laughs> and so I do this kind of advocacy. So I, I went and I was meeting with the general who was running the, uh, the invasion of uh, the, the US troops going into Iraq. And so he was very generous with his time. He told me that uh, I should have another cup of coffee and, and then have another yeah. cup of coffee and have another cup of coffee. And, I was going on and telling him about how this is the moment. This is the moment you need to bring women in to the, the core of what you're doing through our forces because you, if you want to stabilize, those women know which disaffected teenagers, these boys, have a weapon under their mattress. Mm. These women are the ones who are perceived as less threatening. So they can get into places where the men can't get. These are the ones who have a whole history of working across lines. And I went on and on. And he listened very attentively. And, and I said, you know, they have tremendous leadership skills that you can tap. These are untapped resources. And he listened some more, and he nodded his head. And then he said, Madam Ambassador, I cannot thank you enough for coming, and I appreciate your time. And I want to assure you that as soon as we can get the place secure, we can think about women's issues. <laughs> I am not talking about cervical cancer. I am talking about security. Now, but that's how hard it is to, I mean, he, he gave me the time. I said all the right things. But it's that context that he didn't have, Don, that, that you're talking about. And he was a good guy. 
He wanted to understand, but he just, he was looking at it from a different lens. And that's what we mean by inclusive security. You actually have to look at security through a different lens that includes the women of Rwanda. Not as these women need our help. That's the problem. We see them as victims. And you see this all the time. I mean, where do you hear about the women leaders in any depth? You hear about them as victims. You know, and how, oh, well, they became leaders because so many men had been killed. <laughs> That's not why be they became leaders. No. I mean, that was one of the circumstances among many yeah, in ones. which sparked all yeah. kinds of uh, their leadership. But they were surging into a, a, a chasm when yeah. the chaos cracked open the culture. Right. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.